so here to talk to you about maintainable JavaScript, I have some tea in my hand without a cover on it. Uh, why that's relevant is because the very first talk I ever gave uh, was a version of this talk. It was, I, I want to say, like seven or eight years ago. And I had an, an uh, open top cup with me. And I was really nervous. And at some point during the talk, I actually tipped the cup over onto my laptop. Uh, and I'm hoping that in seven years, I have learned better and will not make that same mistake. But if you start to see smoke coming from up here, that's what's going on. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I work for a company called Box. Uh, and I've written a few books on JavaScript. I have actually written one called Maintainable JavaScript, uh, which I wrote to follow up on this talk. So if you enjoy the talk and you'd like to learn more, uh, that's a great place to go. Uh, on Twitter, I am SlickNet. Um, love for you to follow me, ask me questions about this talk uh, or anything else at any point in time. I won't answer them during the talk, obviously, but after the talk. Uh, so what are we talking about? Maintainability. Uh, and why do we actually care? Uh, this is one of those things that I find software engineers have a hard time wrapping their brain around. Because when you have a feature that's due, and you feel kind of pressured, like, well, I just want this stuff to work. And you know, maybe you put something in, and you think, well, I'm not too proud of that, but at least it works. right? Um, well, the reason that we care is that most of your time is actually spent maintaining code. But so creating new code is what you do when you sit down at your computer, and you open up your IDE, and you press Control-N, or whatever is the appropriate thing on a Mac. Uh, and you create a completely new file, and you start typing. And so that's creating something new. Now, after you've created something new, and you get up and go and get some coffee, and you come back, now you're maintaining code. It's no longer just completely new. It's something that you had that now you need to continue to work with. That's maintaining code. And most of the time, we spend our days and, unfortunately, our nights when things don't work. Uh, trying to maintain code. And so it's really important to stop and think about what we can do to make that code more maintainable. Now, who cares? Well, your company cares. Right? When you are hired, you're hired by your company not just to produce code, uh, but to create value through the code that you produce. And you do that by making sure that the code continues to work, even if you're not around. It wouldn't actually be very useful if you wrote code, and then because you're here at a conference today, that code stops working. Well, somebody else eventually is going to have to maintain that code. Uh, and the company that you work for is expecting you to write code in such a way that other people can actually maintain it. Uh, your coworkers. OK. So if you, how many people have ever had the experience of like somebody's out of town, and their code breaks, and you have to go in and fix it, and you're just horrified? Yeah. Happens all the time. right? Now, wouldn't it be great instead if you're able to open up that code and be like, oh, I get it. I know what was going on here. I'm just going to go in and fix it. Now, that's a much, much better option. Uh, and that's why your coworkers care. Right? At some point, you are the person who's not in the office and your code breaks. Never happens to me, but I'm sure for you guys. Your code breaks, and somebody else needs to deal with it. Now, I understand the mentality. Uh, we're, we're in a very interesting field. And why this is an interesting field is because most of the people who are good at what they do, at front end development, at web development, whatever you want to call it, um, most of us are self-taught. There's not a ton of people who are learning this stuff in school, in college. There's not a ton of uh, universities that are offering degrees in web development or front end development. And so we're all learning this stuff on our own. And that makes us artists. That's what artists do. The best artists, you know, there's like some little six year old that goes over and plays on the piano, all of a sudden it's a concerto, right? Taught by his or herself. 
Uh, and then they grow up and you try to put them into classes. Right? Let's teach you how to read music. Let's teach you like, all of the different ways that you can compose music. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, you're messing with my art, man. I'm a rock star. You got to let me deal with my own process. Right? And we all want to be rock stars, because that's the way that we learned. Like, I learned to write JavaScript on my own. I'm sure many of you learned to write JavaScript on your own. And therefore, you have your own style. You have your own way of doing things. And you have your own way of thinking about the problems that you're trying to solve. Uh, but when you're working on a team, you have to give up a little bit of yourself for the betterment of everybody that you're working with. And so this talk is about code, but it's really about teamwork. It's about how do you work with code in such a way that you can work with other people with that code. And that's something that not a lot of people even stop to think about. Right, well, I know the right way of doing it, so I'm just going to do it that way. And yeah, that guy over in that corner over there, like he's totally doing it wrong, but whatever. I'm, I'm doing it right. So what is maintainable code? Uh, I'd like to say that maintainable code works for five years without major changes. And that's usually where people start going, <gasps> that's not possible. How can you write code that keeps working five years from now? I can't write code that's still working five days from now. <laughs> it's actually possible uh, if you stop and think a little bit about what you're doing uh, and how you're doing it. Uh, I actually had, uh, which is pretty cool, my second job, which now is over 10 years ago. Somebody emailed me last year and said, hey, I'm working with this code that you wrote. First of all, I was like, holy crap, my code's still around after 10 years. That's a little bit scary. Um, but you'd be surprised how long your code actually lasts. And, and he said, I just want to thank you, because it's actually really easy to work with. And I was like, cool. Like, that's, I think, one of the best compliments I've ever gotten, is like, my crappy ass code that I wrote when I was three years out of college is something that somebody is still using today and not finding it horrible. Well, that's pretty cool. And so what are some of the things that make maintainable code? Uh, one is that it's intuitive. Uh, that means that you can just kind of skim over the code, and you kind of sort of understand what's going on. You don't really have to dig too deep. Uh, you can open up the file, and after about 30 seconds of skimming it over, say, OK, I generally get the idea about what we're doing here. That's understandable. And so when you go beneath that surface layer and start looking at the actual code, it still makes sense. So you have that initial intuitive reaction to it of knowing uh, what it's doing. And then when you dug deep, it held true. So that actually is what it's doing. And now you get more detail. Uh, it's adaptable. So you can go in and make small changes here and there. And it doesn't just fall apart on you. It's extendable. Now, uh, that means that you can add new functionality to it, and it doesn't just completely fall apart. Uh, and this is usually the area where I see the most trouble, where people don't build things to be extendable. And debuggable. It's actually not a word. There's like a little red squiggly uh, on my monitor for that. Um, but basically, you know that your code is going to have to be debugged, and so if you can do certain things to make it easier to debug, then that just helps everybody. And the last one, of course, is testable. If your code is not testable, there's no way that it can be maintained in the future, because people will be afraid to make changes to it. And so Chris Epstein, who created Compass, uh, said in a talk, which I really love, be kind to your future self. Because the person that may be maintaining your crappy code could be you. So think about that. If you're writing code and you're like, man, in another month, I'm going to have no idea what I'm doing here. Uh, and that probably means you should stop and think a little bit more carefully about how you're writing your code. Okay, So let's talk a little bit about code conventions. Code conventions help you to write maintainable code um, by making sure that everybody's on the same page. 
And code conventions are made up of a couple different things. One is code style, and that's literally syntax type issues. And then there's also programming practices, and that's small patterns that help you avoid trouble. So if you don't have a code style guide, I highly recommend that you look into it. And that's because we spend most of our time communicating with one another as software engineers through code. Right? We spend a little bit of time in email, a little bit of time in IRC and chat, but we spend a lot of time communicating with each other through code. Right? That's where we're saying the most in our day-to-day -day job. And making sure that everybody's speaking the same language is very important so that we can understand each other. There's this great quote from the structure and interpretation of computer programs. That programs are meant to be read by humans and only incidentally for computers to execute. It makes sense. Computers don't have to maintain that code, just have to run it. Computers don't care about all the extra white space and the comments and stuff. It doesn't care at all. It's us, the software engineers, that care about what the code actually looks like. Uh, and people appreciate nice looking code. They will comment to you on the Twitter when they come across code that they like. Uh, so this is my buddy Tom, who I was talking about code quality one day online, and he was teasing me. I like to stand beneath people's bedroom windows and read your code aloud. But that's what you should be going for. And it, you should be so proud of the code that you've written that you want people to see it, rather than hoping that nobody ever sees it because you're so embarrassed by it. It's not the best way to go. Uh, and there are a bunch of guides out there that you can use as a start. So of course, Doug Crockford has one. Um, you can go check out code conventions for the JavaScript programming language. Uh, Google has a JavaScript style guide as well. And these are all just examples, by the way, that you can build off of. I'm not saying that one is more correct than the other. Uh, jQuery Core has some style guidelines I'd like you to follow if you're going to submit code for jQuery. Uh, Dojo, as well, has a style guide. You'll find this with a lot of open source projects. Uh, and then there's a project called Idiomatic JS, which is started by Rick Waldron as just a collection of generally how do you write common idioms in JavaScript. So you should be prepared uh, when you start talking about code style uh, to get into arguments with people. When I was consulting, I would actually go around to companies and help them establish style guides. Uh, and we always got into like really heated arguments about things that you think are not that important, right? like indentation. Uh, because everybody has an idea about how indentation should be done, and everybody else is wrong. So it's either tabs or spaces. And then if you go spaces, then it's how many spaces. Um, and then do you want to mix tabs and spaces for certain alignment purposes? And I, I once had a half hour conversation just about indentation, uh, which I'm glad I don't have to do anymore. Um, but you should be prepared for that. And you should be prepared to figure out how to resolve those issues. Right? Because it doesn't really matter. Uh, like indentation, is there right and wrong? No. Does it matter? No, it only matters that everybody's doing the same thing. Uh, and so you want to avoid opening up code and looking like this. Right? Like how, how many people have ever opened up code, uh, a piece of code that you hadn't worked on before? And the first thing you do, first thing you do before anything else is you re-indent the entire file. Yeah, right? Um, it, it's a big pain if everybody's not indenting the same way. So that's like your baseline. Make sure everybody's indenting the same way. Uh, you can avoid a situation where it looks like that else actually goes to the if at the top because of crappy indentation. Uh, but in reality, it does not. Right? So fix your indentation. Uh, another thing I like to tell people is the, the less code on one line, the less likely you'll encounter a merge conflict. So if you think that you're being like super spiffy and keeping everything on one line, and therefore you're able to go out and be like, well, I mean, I only did that in like five lines of code. Like, yeah, but you have like 2,000 characters on each line. Right? So that doesn't really count. Um, I like to put as few things on a line as possible. So I, I really don't like code that looks like this. 
Right? Merge conflicts abound here. So just moving stuff out, uh, you actually make your life easier later on. Right, comments. Uh, comments are like one of the least favorite things of developers. <laughs> right? Comments, even though you're writing it in code, uh, comments sneak into that category of documentation, and everybody hates writing documentation. Uh, but comments are really important. Uh, and there is no such thing as self-documenting code. I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, that is a myth perpetuated by people who hate to write documentation. Absolutely. So why is that? Oh, but my code is pretty. You should be able to figure it out. Yeah. The point is, you shouldn't have to read through every line of code to figure out what it's doing. That's a waste of time. You read through every line of code when there's a problem in that code or when you're debugging something. But you don't do that when you just need to get up to speed and figure out what's going on. That's when comments are helpful. Tell me what's going on so I don't have to read every single line of code. And so what should you do? Uh, definitely every method. Um, tell me what's going in, what's coming out, and why the hell this function exists in the first place. Uh, I was just looking at some code with some colleagues yesterday, gigantic JavaScript file. And we went through every function and tried to figure out what that function was doing. And I would say about half of them, we had no clue and had to actually go like grepping through the code base to see if it was actually used, and then seeing in what context it was used. Uh, really sucks. So difficult to understand code. So if you look at some code and you think, uh, you know, if I go away on vacation next week and I come back the following week, I might have trouble figuring out what the hell I'm doing here. It's probably a good spot to start adding some comments. Right, so this is taken from YUI. Um, that was a really good example of just, you know, there's a bunch of arguments being passed around, a bunch of different modes. And without those comments, you would really not be able to figure out what was going on. A code that might seem wrong when you scan it quickly. Very important to put a comment there. So in this case, there is an equal sign in the control condition for a while loop. Now, most of the time, Say 90% of the time, that's going to be a mistake. You usually intend to put double equals because you're doing a comparison. But in this case, it was actually intended to do assignment. And so the author added a code in there that says note assignment. So that you don't accidentally, being you know, the helpful programmer that you are, see that one day and be like, oh, my colleague made a mistake. I'm just going to go and add that second equals. and. All will be right in the world. And congratulations, you just introduced a bug because you were trying to fix code that wasn't broken. So anytime there's code that might seem wrong, you're doing it for a reason, though. You throw in a comment there. Let's talk about naming. Naming is hard. It's one of the hard problems in computer science. We just use some logical names. Uh, I really hate reading code where like, every variable is one or two characters because people are trying to be concise, um, as if that helps anything. Uh, don't worry about the length. Name your variables and your functions whatever is the most appropriate name. That helps everybody. I usually like to say variable names should be nouns. Functions begin with a verb. Um, for Booleans, you use words like is and has that kind of tells you what you're expecting to return. Um, and avoid useless names like foo and temp. Similar o, bar, baz, all that stuff. Um, that really doesn't help me to understand what your code is doing. I, I want to know what the purpose of that variable is uh, and how I should or should not be using it. And foo and temp doesn't really help. All right, so this code I showed you earlier just makes my brain hurt. Uh, too many small uh, variable names. I have no idea what's going on. Don't want to look at that code ever again. Right? So in JavaScript, the standard is camel casing. Uh, if you're not doing camel casing, I'm confused. That's how everything, all of the native JavaScript stuff is done in camel casing. Save yourself the cognitive overhead 
and just do camel casing as well. And then you don't have to worry, like, is this a browser thing? Is it a me thing? I don't really know. Camel casing is fun. So uh, for variable names, usually start with a lowercase letter first, and then every word after that, uppercase letter. Uh, functions the same. Objects, properties, the same. So what about acronyms? This is one of my favorite questions. You know, camel case, is an acronym a word? And so you capitalize the first letter and the rest are lowercase? Or is an acronym just an acronym and so everything should be uppercase? Well, it, it's a hard decision. And you can actually tell that by looking at the browser native APIs. Right? So we have get element by ID. Right? It's actually like id. So I, lowercase d. It's a Freudian thing. Uh, and then you have inner HTML, right? All caps. So clearly, this is a hard problem that a lot of people kind of punt on. And if this isn't confusing enough, I got a better one for you. <laughs> right? We're going to mix them. XML, that's clearly an acronym that should be all uppercase. HTTP, I'm not sure. That could be a word. <laughs> so we're just going to treat that like a word. Yeah. Um, so when you're doing this, make a decision and stick with it. If only the browser vendors would do the same. Uh, some of the exceptions, I, I really like to use all uppercase with an underscore for things that are constant like. And since JavaScript doesn't officially have constants yet, um, I just like to use this so that it's really obvious that this variable is intended to only be read from and never written to. Uh, constructor functions typically begin with a capital letter, or just like the ones that are native in the browser, object, array, date, error, stuff like that. OK, so that's it for code conventions. Let's talk about programming practices. These are small patterns for common problems. So think of them like mini design patterns. And I really love this quote. Uh, there are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. And the other is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. Uh, I prefer the former. I like to tell people that uh, if when you're solving a problem it feels too complicated, you're probably solving the wrong problem. You haven't broken it down into small enough pieces yet. Right? The simpler your solution is, the easier it is for you to deal with and for everybody else to deal with. Now, on the front end, we have these layers. Right? So we have presentation, which is CSS. We have behavior, which is JavaScript. And we have data or structure, which is HTML. And in an ideal world, you keep these pretty well separated. Uh, in other words, you don't want to cross the streams. Right? Am I dating myself with this reference? <laughs> A little bit. Um, it, it really behooves you to keep your JavaScript, your CSS, and your HTML as separate as possible. It makes debugging a lot easier. It makes maintaining a lot easier. Uh, and so you don't want to do something like this. You don't want to have your JavaScript directly embedded inside of your HTML. Well, why? Well, number one, uh, if your JavaScript isn't loaded yet and somebody clicks on that, then it causes an error. Number two, if you have to change the name of that function, you need to change it in two places. You need to change it in your JavaScript, and then you need to change it in your HTML. And you may be thinking, well, that's not such a big deal. If I'm doing it without putting it directly in the HTML, I'll have to change it in multiple places in the JavaScript anyway. Correct. And that's OK, because that's where you're working, in the JavaScript. But when you're working in JavaScript, it's hard for you to stop and think, oh, actually, along with this JavaScript change, now I have to make this HTML change. And then if somebody else starts maintaining that code, then they have to discover that. Right? And that's some maintenance overhead that's not really worthwhile. So keep your JavaScript out of HTML. Keep your HTML out of JavaScript. Uh, 
if you have HTML strings in your JavaScript, that is going to be a problem. So why is that going to be a problem? Well, when you notice that your DOM structure is incorrect in a page, where are you going to go first to try to figure that out? Just yell it out. Pretend we're friends. You're going to go to your HTML, uh, your templates, whatever, your PHP, your Smarty templates, your mustache templates, whatever. That's where you're going to go and try to find it. And you're going to spend all day looking for that HTML code that is not there. It is actually in your JavaScript. And if I seem bitter about this, it's because I have been bitten by this in the past. In case you haven't figured it out, most of what I'm talking about is stuff I've been bitten by in the past. Speaking of, keep JavaScript out of your CSS. Thankfully, um, Internet Explorer has finally removed this. But uh, horrible, horrible thing. Please don't do it. Same thing. Right? If there's a JavaScript error, are you going to stop and think to look in your CSS for it? No. Uh, and, and this was something that happened to me I don't know, several years ago, uh, where I got a bug. It was a JavaScript error. I said, like, OK. So I started debugging, like setting breakpoints. And granted, this was uh, in the day where we were talking like IE6, maybe Firefox 1. So things were a little bit different than they are today. Uh, but still, I was going through and trying to find it, and I couldn't find it. So I'm like, fine. Uh, I'm going to do like, the dirtiest thing that I know, and I'm just going to start like, commenting out big sections of JavaScript. And I just you know, would come out one function, two functions, three. Uh, and eventually, I got to the point where I had commented out every line of JavaScript in the application. And I still had a JavaScript error. <laughs> and after spending an entire day on this, I still don't know what possessed me to look into the CSS. But that's what it was. It was an expression uh, that was in the CSS that was causing the JavaScript error. So fortunately, future generations won't have to deal with it. Um, but until IE8 and lower completely go away, something to be aware of. Uh, keep your CSS out of JavaScript. Right? If you're assigning a bunch of individual styles in JavaScript, uh, that's going to lead you astray. Why? Same deal. When there's a styling issue, where do you want to go to fix that issue? CSS. Your CSS. That's right. Uh, and if the styling issue isn't in your CSS, what are you probably going to do first? Look at the HTML? Maybe. Or you just add more CSS and fix the problem. <laughs> Except that the original problem is in your JavaScript, so you haven't actually fixed the problem. Uh, so yeah, don't do that. Um, in JavaScript, when you're handling events, don't put extra application or business logic in that event handler. So in this case, I would say that handle click is doing too much. Because the click happens, and then I'm showing a div in a certain position. All right, what's better? Well, let's break out a function that is a show pop-up function. So I can actually call something that says what it does and does what it says. All right, dating myself with that as well, I know. Um, but that's not the best either, because I'm still passing the event object around. And that means that if I want to write a test for show pop-up, I need to stub out an entire event object. And I really hate doing that, because the event object has a ton of properties on it. And that makes show pop-up kind of opaque when you're looking at it from the outside. You're not sure what data it's using. Uh, in order to do its job. And so what you do is you let the event handler just handle the event and take the pieces off of the event object that you need and pass that into a method that does something. So in this case, show pop-up just accepts x and y. Right? Very easy to write a test for that. Uh, and then handle click just calls show pop-up with client x and client y. Right? Much, much easier to deal with for testing purposes. This is one of my favorites. Don't modify objects that you don't own. 
So adding stuff to array.prototype, not the best of ideas. Uh, just for fun, I'm overriding a method on YUI, also not the best of ideas. Why? Uh, so again, this is one of those things where when you're working by yourself, do whatever the hell you want. I really don't care. Uh, as soon as my code is dependent on your code and dependent on the environment in which all of our code is running, then I care. And so if I'm depending on yui.use to act a certain way, and you decide to change that, now my code is going to be broken. Because I'm using something the way it was intended to be used, but somebody else came along and changed what it did. This is also something that bit me in my career, where I was using uh, YUI2 at the time. And it had a method called stop event. And stop event very simply would prevent default and then stop propagation. That's all it did. But nice convenience function so that I didn't have to write two lines of code. I could write one. Uh, and we started getting all these bugs and spent a couple days debugging and finally tracked it back to somebody had overridden stop event with some other implementation. And just for fun, that other implementation actually attached a different event handler someplace else. And so all kinds of code was breaking. Right? Not the best idea, because we were all dependent on what that function actually was supposed to do. Uh, and that's the same for native objects, too. I start adding stuff to array, adding stuff to document, all really, really bad ideas. Uh, and I actually did a long blog post about this, uh, just walking through a bunch of different examples that have happened over the past 10 years where this has bitten either me or other people in the community and why it's such a bad idea. I try to avoid that. Um, and also avoid global functions and variables. So this one that I showed you earlier, not the best example. Should really always have your methods attached to some object. In most cases, you can get away with having one global object that you use for your product. Uh, for us, we have just a top level box object. Yahoo had a top level Yahoo object. Uh, just pick one thing, and then you can namespace everything off of that. Just don't start throwing things randomly into the global scope. It gets really confusing. It gets really hard to write tests. Don't be afraid to throw your own errors. When I was a young developer many, many years ago, I first came across throw uh, when I was learning Java. And I thought, man, that is the dumbest thing I have ever heard of in my life. My whole point as a programmer is to avoid errors. Why would I ever create an error intentionally? That is stupid. Now that I have some gray hairs, it makes a lot more sense to me. The point of throwing errors isn't like I'm creating an error. It's that there is a likelihood that an error is going to occur at this point. And when that happens, I want to know exactly what's going on. Browsers give you notoriously horrible error messages by default. Like, uh, null is undefined. All right. Attempt to access property on undefined. OK, what am I supposed to do with that? No, that sucks. So what you can do is, if it's a spot where you anticipate there might be an error that would be hard to track down, you can throw your own error. And all you have to do is check for that condition. So in this case, uh, if the first argument is missing, this method will fail horrifically. So I'm just going to check for that. And if it's not there, I'm going to throw a new error. And all you have to do is throw new error, give it a message, and that's the message that will show up in your console. So put in a method name, put in a note to yourself, whatever you want. Just put something that will make sense to you so that you'll know where to go in order to fix that error. Avoid null comparisons. So most of the time, if you're comparing something against null, you're not being specific enough. So in this case, 
if items is the number one, that if statement will be true, and I'll try to do items.sort, and that will cause an error. Not the best idea in the world. It's better to test for exactly what you want. If I know that I need an array to do something and otherwise the world is going to explode, then let's just make sure that that thing is an array and make sure that somebody didn't accidentally pass in a number or a string or some other random object that isn't an array. So when you're avoiding null comparisons, uh, you can use instance of to check for a specific type of object that you're expecting to be passed in. You can use type of to test for primitive types. That's string, number, boolean. Uh, just be careful, because type of null is equal to object for some unknown reason. That's also a good idea to separate out your configuration data from your JavaScript. And so in this case, I have two things that I would consider configuration data. And that's a string that's being shown to the user, and that's a URL. And I consider configuration data basically anything that has a high likelihood of changing, even though it doesn't necessarily affect the behavior of the code. And so what do you do? Well, as a starting point, you can just separate all of that data out into a separate object that you can reference later. That way, you're taking that data out of the actual functionality, which means that when you need to change the data, there's less of a risk of you introducing a bug in the functionality. That's really what we want to avoid here, is every time you go in and touch code, you have uh, a chance of introducing a bug. And how do you reduce that likelihood? Well, you take the things that change a lot and you move them out of the important parts of your code. So you can get those out into an object of its own. Um, basically, you want to pull out any URL. URLs have a really bad habit of changing. In theory, they should be there forever. In practice, they change a lot, uh, especially if you're changing application frameworks. They have completely different URL schemes, and then you have to go digging through all your JavaScript to find out where to change those URLs. Don't want to do that. Uh, any strings that are displayed to the user should not be in your JavaScript. Those change very frequently as well. Any HTML that needs to be created from JavaScript, you want to have that separated out. Uh, these days, you have some really nice options, like with mustache and handlebars and other client-side templating languages that allow you to have completely separate files that you can load. Uh, any settings, so items per page, uh, theme, things like that, you want to have outside of your primary JavaScript code. Uh, any repeated unique values, so if you're seeing the same if you're using the same class name, CSS class name, in your JavaScript frequently, you may want to pull that out as well. Uh, and basically, anything that has a li high likelihood of changing in the future. Uh, and because I was working on this problem a bit last year, I created this little utility called props to JS. And all it does is it takes a Java properties file, uh, which is just key value pairs key equals value, and it will convert it into a JSON object for you uh, or a JavaScript object, something that you can include in your JavaScript. So you can keep configuration data separate from your JavaScript and then generate JavaScript uh, that has that configuration data in it so you can just access it directly. Up on GitHub, open source, uh, it's pretty much done. It doesn't do much. so. Safe to use. For the last section here, I'd like to talk about automation. So automation makes everyone's life easier. Now, once you've come up with these code conventions and these patterns, it's really hard to keep an eye on all the code that's passing through the system. And so as much as possible, if you can automatically check for style issues, check for other sorts of issues, that's just going to help the quality of your code overall, because you don't have to keep everything that you're expected to do in your head. You can have a tool that helps you with that. 
And so how many people have a build process for their JavaScript? Oh, it's a little less than half the room. That's awesome. I'm very happy about that. Um, having a build process for your JavaScript really, really helps a lot of things. Um, it gets in the way a little bit with people who are used to like editing code and then switching over to the browser and pressing F5. Um, but there's really even ways that you can work around that as well. Uh, and there's all kinds of cool things that you can do in a build. You can add and remove debugging statements. I really love being able to put in JavaScript code that's intended just to be run in my development environment and never actually in production, and then just stripping that out as part of the build process. Uh, concatenating files is a big one to get as few JavaScript files to the client as possible. Uh, generate documentation. So now that you've added all of those really nice comments into your code, you can generate documentation from it automatically. Uh, validate your code. Make sure that it's syntactically correct and following certain style conventions. Testing your code automatically, minifying files before they go out to production, uh, and even deploying. You can do all of this within a single build system. Uh, and so I have a bunch of tools to share with you. They're all links. Um, don't worry too much about copying down the URLs. The slides are available up on SlideShare, so you can just grab it from there afterwards. Uh, so there's this tool called JS Build Tools. It's just one tool. Don't let it fool you. Um, that lets you add and remove debugging statements, kind of C style, like uh, pound defined and pound if, that sort of stuff. Uh, JS doc for generating documentation. It was one of the first JavaScript documentation generators. Uh, it's now on JS doc 3. There have been several versions of it and keeps getting better. Uh, and this uses a sort of javadoc style comment uh, to be able to produce that documentation. There's YUI doc, which has a format that's very similar to JavaDoc, but has a lot of different types of constructs in it, like modules, um, standalones, and mix-ins that help with a lot of the more dynamic things that we're doing in JavaScript these days. There's also Doco. So Doco is a little bit different than JS doc and YUI doc. Uh, JS Doc and YUI Doc are more API documenters. So they create like really nicely formatted files that say, here's an object, here are the methods available on this object, here are the arguments that you pass in to these methods. Doco is more of a tutorial style documentation generator where it takes your comments and it puts them side by side with the code that they're commenting. So you end up with a really nice HTML file where you can go through the JavaScript on one side and then read what it's doing on the other. Uh, it's very cool, just a different type of tool for documentation. For validating code, there's JS Lint, which is Doug Crockford's opinionated tool for how you should write your JavaScript. Uh, there's JS Hint, which is a fork of JS Lint that is less opinionated about what you should do uh, and has more options for triggering things on and off. For minifying files, so you want to remove excess white space. You want to remove, um, you want to replace variable names with smaller ones automatically. Uh, the previous gold standard for this was YUI Compressor. It was one of the first uh, tools that actually used a JavaScript compiler to get the parse tree and figure out what to do. Uh, the current gold standard is Uglify.js, which does a lot of the same stuff that YUI Compressor does, plus a lot of other either ingenious or really scary things, depending on how you look at it, to make your code even smaller. This is uh, a lot of open source projects that were using YUI Compressor are now switching over to Uglify. There's Closure Compiler, which is Google's uh, similar tool. It does a lot of the same things as YUI Compressor and Uglify. Um, a, a lot of the same caveats as with Uglify. Is it it's, tends to be very aggressive in what it does, so you need to be a little bit careful with what options you apply. Um, but still, good tools. So overall, how do you tie these together? 
Um, one of my old favorites has always been Ant, which is a Java build system. Uh, and even though it's a Java build system, there's a lot of built-in tasks that make it really useful for JavaScript, uh, like built-in concatenating and replacing regular expressions in files, stuff like that. Um, Julian Lecomte, who created YUI Compressor, actually wrote a nice article several years ago about how to build web, a web applications with Ant. Uh, the new exciting one is Grunt, which is uh, a Node.js based build system written in JavaScript, and you write JavaScript in order to configure that build system. Uh, it's going through a ton of development right now. There's a ton of plugins. There's also a ton of changes coming. Uh, so it's not yet at 1.0. So very fun to play with. Make sure you're keeping an eye on it going forward. Uh, and Ben, who wrote Grunt, also wrote a really great introduction uh, on what Grunt is and how do you use it. So when you have a build system, you actually want to create a few different types of builds. And usually you do like a development build, a testing build, and a deployment build. Uh, and that lets you mix and match the different things that you do in each one. So for all of them, maybe you want to add or remove debugging uh, code in there, validate your code. Testing code, always good to do. Uh, and then in development, maybe you also want to generate some documentation. Right? That's important. Um, but in testing and deployment, you don't need to do that. So you just concatenate your files together, and you minify your files. And then in deployment, maybe that even deploys your files out to a CDN somewhere. So having this build system in there gives you a lot of different options. Like create as many different types of builds as you want for just the things that you're trying to do. <clears throat> So at the end here, it's just some things to remember. Uh, code style guidelines ensure that everyone's speaking the same language. And that's important because we are communicating with each other through code. That's our primary communication medium. Loose coupling of your front end layers makes changing and debugging easier later on. Good programming practices allow for easier debugging. So make sure that you're leaving yourself little hints as to what you should be doing. And code organization and automation help to bring some sanity to all of this. And just make sure that you don't have to remember on your own everything that you're expected to do. And I'd like to leave you with this thought. Always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>